this keyboard was an exciting opportunity for me. You see, back in the olden days of early 2021, before all this YouTube nonsense and custom keyboard hobby wrecked my savings and social life, I had the naive thought of avoiding just mentioned results by not giving in to custom boards and instead going the pre built route. Well, we all know how that went. I am never gonna financially recover from that. But back then I had a choice to make, iQnix or Keychron. I ultimately went for the latter and if you've been around on this channel for a while, you'll no doubt have heard me talk really positively about my experience I have with the King 6. But of course I always wondered how the iQnix boards would have been. Are they any good? Did I make the right decision or did I miss out? Well, I can finally somewhat answer that question after iQnix was kind enough to send me one of their OG80s, the dark side. Considering my usual preferences, this 80% keep is a new territory for me, but I thought it looked the coolest from the current lineup and it did charm me a bit. So what is this exactly? Well, as just mentioned, this is the iQnix OG80 Darkside. A mouthful, yes. Darkside is its given name, which refers to the color scheme. The model is the OG80, but beware, not all OG80s are made the same. This one, for example, has cherry style stabs, while the wormhole variant you can select between this and co-star stabs. If you've never heard about co-star, they kind of look like fancy riser bars on cycles. They're pretty cool, the bars, not the stabs. Those I have no experience with. Because of that, I can't really comment on them, but some people seem to like them, some not so much. Back to the OG80. I really dig the design of this. It's definitely different and not for everyone. Normally I would totally go for something more minimal looking. For example, the Space 80 is already too noisy for my taste as well. Something like the Trio 60 on the other hand, is more up my alley. But for some reason, the OG80 has something about it that just kind of looks cool. I like how the F row is slightly raised and angled towards you. It does make using these keys slightly easier and reminds me of those old terminal or control consoles from the 70s or 80s, a time of design that I very much adore. If we peek over the edge, that nostalgic influence continues with what appears to be cooling grills or ventilation gaps. They serve no purpose, but again, look very industrial and aggressive. You'll also find a solitary USB-C port on the left, but nothing else on the back. If you take a closer look at the side, we can see that unique profile again with a fixed typing angle, meaning you unfortunately cannot change it. Now, I say unfortunately as this option might be something that you are looking for, but considering the lines of this board, I would say adjustable feet would have ruined the looks. At the front, we have the lowest height of all the boards I've tried so far, coming in at around 17 or 18 millimeters, just a little shallower than my previous top runner, the Mega, making this one of the most comfortable typing experiences I've ever had. I feel like this is a part that is somewhat overlooked, but for someone like me that doesn't like the clutter that is wrist rests, although I probably should shut up about those as I've actually never tried one. Anyway, it's very comfortable to type on is what I'm trying to say. If you close our tour on the outside, we have a few remaining details. One is the big LED that acts as your caps lock, connectivity and miscellaneous indicator of choice. I'm not sure yet if I like it. It definitely fits the rest of the board's aesthetics with its faint glow and fuzzy edges, reminding us once again of the 70s or 80s, but somehow I wonder if a sharper, more defined glow would have looked better. I really don't know. While we're at it, if you haven't guessed it yet, this keyboard offers the usual connectivity we've come to expect from pre -bills. That is wired, wireless via the dongle, which is the best wireless, and Bluetooth, where it can pair with up to three devices. You can also connect it to your mobile and switch profiles, just like with any of the other boards. But there's one area where they somehow really missed an obvious solution, and that is the battery indication. As just mentioned, it'll glow red when it's about to die, but if you thought you could hit, let's say, function B to see the battery status like a new file, you'd be wrong. No, get your brain cells ready, because if you hit function B, you have to start counting. So in this example, it blinked nine times, which means we are about 90% battery. I really don't understand why they couldn't just show different colors. Granted, it's more granular than a new file which only shows three levels, but I really don't need more and waiting for the ninth blink is just agonizing. His finger looking good. Just above that, we have a very neat little storage compartment for the USB dongle. The lid is attached by two magnets and when not in use, can act as a fidget spinner stand-in or a compartment for alternative substances. The top right also has the only visible branding during normal use, a shiny silver sticker that 
Unfortunately, on my unit, it did not exactly fit the grove. A minor detail, but one I cannot unsee anymore. Flipping the good thing around, we find ourselves amongst a more defined branding, as well as a single switch to change between wired and wireless mode. You probably already noticed, but as this keyboard is in a lower price segment than most customs, I will compare it to other pre-builds I've tried, like the Keychron, Nufi or Malgeek, all of which have similar toggles, but also have one for changing between Mac and Windows. The OG80 doesn't have this, at least not a physical one. You can actually change the button layout by holding Function Tab until the LED blinks three times again with the counting, which I actually prefer over the mechanical alternative and in the box you'll also find Mac focused caps to match your chosen operating system. These are double shot PBT, which honestly are really nice. The lettering is clear enough and consistent to give it a very nice clean look. The caps also feel much more solid than the ones found on the K6 for example. Although those have a very nice design, I never really liked the very light plastic that was used on them. It always felt unnecessarily cheap. Compared to the Keychron's new OSA caps, the lettering is also much more consistent and they feel great with a slightly textured top and otherwise good all-around profile. If that wasn't enough, you'll find something rather unusual in here, or at least unusual to me, a metal artisan cap, most probably meant to replace the escape. Now, calling this an artisan cap is perhaps a slight insult to all artisan caps that have ever been crafted. But considering that this is a mass-produced product, the fact that they included one for free is actually really nice, even though it just sports the iQnix logo instead of something more befitting to the theme of the keyboard. Before we step into the actual typing experience, let's have a look at the RGB of this beauty. Now, I'm not a fan of any sort of glowing bits on a keyboard, unless it's a tasteful light strip. But the faint but still very visible underglow of the OG80 is something I found myself not turning off, especially the solid pink one which I ended up reverting to the most. There are only 4 colors to choose from and 3 brightness levels, less than compared to the options on a new 5 for example, but that didn't really bother me. For the different lighting modes next to this solid one, you have your usual fare of seizure inducing rainbow vomit that is RGB. I'm not one to judge, if you like this, go for it, but I don't. One last thing about the RGB though, even though the case has a slight translucent finish, you won't be getting any side action here. The caps also don't have shine through lettering, what you will get will be in between the keys, which seems to be a recurring theme on pre-builds these days. That being said, let's move over to the typing experience and what we might be able to do to improve it. Coming from the OLAP spring, which is what I've been using for the past few months, the first impression I got was, this is firm, very firm. There is no bounce, nothing, no flex of any kind, which from a construction point of view is actually not that bad, it's built really well, but without any give during typing, the initial experience for people looking for a more flexible relationship will find this a bit more constraining. Of course, comparing this to a $600 keyboard is not exactly fair, and looking at other pre-builds in this price range, that is, besides the Mojo 68, it's to be expected. There are other newcomers though, as such as the custom keyboards that Keychron has been spitting out as of late, which do have a lot of bounce in them. But one isn't necessarily better than the other, some people do prefer firmer boards. I like a little flex though, it just makes my typing feel a bit more comfortable. The sound isn't all that bad either, even if out of the box it probably wouldn't win any awards. This is understandable if you just take one peek inside, there's a lot of space, which could be filled up, so let's try to do that. Now, before we get into this, I don't think the OG80 is meant to be opened, but in a market segment where modification and customization are the bee's knees, it would be wrong of me not to try this, but keep in mind that other pre-builds aren't meant to be opened either, with some exceptions. However, here I feel like it was made especially difficult to do so. There are a total of 6 self-tapping screws on the bottom, 4 of which are hidden beneath the rubber feet. If you remove them, make sure you get the sticky bit as well, otherwise it'll be difficult to attach them again later. The other two screws are in the center, one visible and reachable with a long screwdriver, my iFixit one for example was too short, and the final one which hides behind the sticker that you will have to vandalize in order to gain access. 
After that, I had to double check a bit because even though all the visible screws were removed, the board didn't budge one bit. It still felt super firm. That's because there are an additional three screws hidden under the caps. Once those are removed, do so as well with the switches while you're at it. The focus then shifts to the horrible, horrible plastic clasps that keep this thing together. This is truly a, pardon my wording, pain in the I hate constructions like this, it just makes everything so unnecessarily difficult to work with and in a world where everybody is happily modding their keyboards, it just feels counterproductive. But let's try it. The easiest way I've found is getting these sides to pop first. Try to separate a small section, small enough to jam something in there that can then be moved towards the clasp. I luckily had an iFixit opening kit with me. Guitar picks are better, but a screwdriver might work too. Just be careful, this is plastic and you might damage something if you use metal or similar materials. Once you get your foot in though, you can move along the frame and listen for the clamps to pop out one by one. For example, after I had both sides propped up, the lower half almost came loose by itself. I then moved on to the top or back side of the keyboard, which also gave in with little to no resistance. The whole process can be quite tiresome though. I was getting increasingly worried when I did this for the first time, as the fear of damage or even breaking it constantly lingered in the background. Separating the two halves after this was a lot easier, but be very careful of the cables that connect the top and bottom. There's a total of four. Remove these first before fully separating the housing. The wireless is the longest one, hiding beneath a little piece of foam, while the two battery cables are almost too short, with the daughter board being somewhere in the middle. Once disconnected, we have two more screws removed before we can lift the guts out of the carcass. There is also a big ribbon cable connecting the two PCBs, which you don't have to remove now, but it's probably safer to do so. Then we can finally lift out the plate to which everything is attached and have a look at the outer framing and its construction. The top is a solid piece with only the LED diffuser as a separate element, that is, if you don't count the lid for the dongle. It's kinda neat looking from the inside, and the only glue used in the entire construction is for the two magnets that keep the lid in. At least I think that, because the two batteries in the lower half of the frame seem to be simply pressed in. They also have a thick piece of foam on top, probably to make sure they don't move around, which seems to be working really well, as there is no rattle of any kind on this board. Also interesting to see in the lower half of this is where the wireless antenna sits, that is to the back of the board where the grill is. Now, let's have a look at the plate and PCBs. This is definitely the most solid part and also where all the weight comes from. There is also a layer of foam sandwiched in between, which I didn't expect, but is a really nice addition. Separating the PCBs requires two screws on either of them. After that, you can simply lift it off to reveal the mentioned foam and to get a closer look at what we got here, which was a bit greasy to my surprise. The stabs were looped pretty generously. I ended up not adding any more as they really was enough. Although, as you'll hear later, it still is where the biggest issue lies. Other than that, the PCB is pretty normal looking, with the arguably most interesting part being the fact that there's two. This reminded me a bit of the work Louderboard I talked about earlier this year. Obviously, they are not compatible, but they felt strangely close. Close enough so that I had to get that one out just to compare it to. Still a neat concept that one is, but nothing more. The plate itself is a really solid and stiff frame, which is where all the non-existing flex is coming from. If we backtrack a tiny bit and look at how this fits into the bottom housing, we can see the way the plate rests on the pillars, adding to that stiffness. Alright, with all the pieces studied, I decided to try to fill in the back underneath the afro in hopes it would cancel out some of the hollowness. I also took a look at the stamps, but as these are cherry clip-ins, I felt there was nothing else I could do. There are no holes nor do screw-ins fit into the frame. I also decided to go the easy route by adding a few layers of tape as this worked pretty well in other boards. For the big hollow space underneath the afro, I went with what came in the box. There are actually two of these dense foam pieces that have just the right dimensions after some trimming. Honestly, I don't really know if this did all that much. The tape mod is probably doing the heavy lifting here, but I concluded that I didn't want to open this board a second time, so I tried to do as much as I could the first time around. After all this, here's how it sounds all stuck again and then with the modifications.
What do you think? I think it's worth it, especially if you got the right tools to open it. It takes a while and you have to be careful, but at almost no cost, this does improve the sound a bit. What still sounded horrible though were the steps, or the spacebar in particular. Despite my inner wish to not go there, I opened it again and tried something I saw on Debucky's channel, which is a really great one if you have never heard about him. He does incredibly beautiful shots and, just like many others in this space, seem to know exactly what he's doing. Unlike me. If you got some gaskets from another keyboard, in my case it was from the Trio 60 which I've recently put together, you can use the leftover pieces and create sort of a cushion for your stabs. Kind of like those that come with old stabs. I was hoping that this would alleviate the rattling issue. It did help, but it did not entirely remove it. When I originally looked for my first mechanical keyboard, the only reason why I didn't go with iQnix over Keychron was the choice of colors and size. Back then, iQnix only had very colorful versions of their boards, which don't look bad, it's just not what I wanted. And I also was looking for something in the 60-65% to form factor, which I believe they didn't have back then. The best known iQnix is probably the F96, which I think looks cool, but again, isn't the form factor or design that I liked. If they would have offered that one in a 65% layout, I would have probably started my journey with them. But comparing it to my K6, the OG does have a few aces up its sleeve. One is the addition of the 2.4GHz dongle, which Keychron does not offer on any of their boards as far as I know. I much prefer this way of connecting. The reaction, especially waking up from sleep, is noticeably faster than with Bluetooth. And for gaming, the response time is down to 1 over 8 milliseconds. Both NuFi and MelGeek offer these too on their boards. Then there is the choice of switches. Keychron has changed to mostly using Gateron Pros, which as much as I love Gaterons, I don't really like their Pro series. They just don't feel that good. Black Inks, Oil Kings or CJs on the other hand are fantastic. The TTC Speed Silver I got in the OG were a big surprise for me though. They felt really, really good. There is a tiny bit of house wobble, so these could be a candidate for a slim layer film, but other than that they are really great out of the box. There is also a tiny bit of lube, really. It's a touch of grease, but it's noticeable and compared to what I originally got on my K6, which were the Gatoron Reds, these are marginally better in my opinion. The board is also, apart from the choice of construction, very nicely built. At around 2.2 pounds or just over 1 kilo, it feels very solid and dense, even though the housing is all plastic. This is due to the metal plate inside, which as mentioned also contributes to the stiff typing experience. Out of all the pre-builds that I've tried, the OG also has by far the best included keycaps. They look and feel far better and could easily make their way to a more premium board, enhancing those looks. I find myself a little perplexed with the OG. I genuinely like it and I kinda want to recommend it, but it really, really depends on what you're looking for. If you plan to start playing around in the custom keyboard world and you're having a difficult time trying to find something that is in stock or you don't want to wait up to or even a year to get your hands on something that you bought today, then you should probably steer clear of the OG because if you like custom keyboards, you inevitably will get the urge to start tinkering around and for that use case, the OG is simply not a good choice. You're probably better off checking thock stock for extras or in-stock boards like the ones from Mode or Keepwork. Now, those will cost quite a bit more, but the OG80 isn't exactly cheap either. At around 200 or 180 when it's on sale, it's a tough sell compared to other pre-builds, which feature matched can be almost half the price. So if you just want something to start out on, like training wheels into the world of custom mechanical keyboards, I think it's a too high price to pay. For that, I still think the K6 at around 65 bucks for the hot swap version is the absolute best. The market has also changed quite a bit, with much more affordable entries, most notably Keychron and the barrage of custom mechs that are flooding us with choices. Out of those, the closest to the OG when it comes to size is probably the Q1, which at the discounted price of 149 is a great deal for an all-metal construction that supports VIA. That's a lot of points towards Keychron and others over iQnix, but the choice is still not that easy. I think where iQnix has an edge over the competition is with its design and let's call it feature completeness out of the box. 
What I mean by that is this has been the board where I feel like you have to do the least in order to get pretty close to more premium offerings out there. Granted, you do pay for it, but I think you have a better switch option, better included keycaps and a bass sound that's definitely more up there with higher end boards. The design is subjective, of course, but even if you don't like how it looks, you have to give credit where it's due. Nothing Iconix makes looks ordinary or like anything else, and design is one of the biggest deciding factors when getting a board. The metal offerings from Keychron, for example, are, well, I don't know, a bit boring. I already got tired of my Q2 and I never get tired of the Spring, Meridian, Mega or this, at least so far. But the time I've spent with all of them and the OG80 isn't equal, so it's not a fair judgement either. However, when I see this across the room sitting on my desk, I get a faint smile. It looks really cool and unique, even if it doesn't do as well as the others. So to answer the question, did I make the right decision in 2021? I think so, because it led me down this path of ridiculous peripherals, but one I continue to gladly take. But if I needed something that works right out of the box, without me having to manually improve it or being a template for experimentation, well, then I would say it's time to join the dark side. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this one. I surely enjoyed making it. I also want to thank iQunix again for sending me the dark side. It's a really fun board. Anyway, thank you again. I hope you're enjoying this summer winter if you're in the southern hemisphere, wherever you are. I hope you're doing fine and see you in the next one. Bye.